Yeah, I'm ready when you are. I had to turn around for a second, but I got it. Ah, shit, you cut the theme song short tonight. All right. Anyways, we are here at the roundtable on HamiltonRadio.net, channel HR2. I am your host, John Brecco, and we've got a very, very special guest on tonight who already found out how much of a hooligan I am. I was trying to be good for this one, too. So, anyways, we have Trevor Newell in here, and there's a lot that I have to talk about with you. First off, how have you been doing through this time? Just a general question. How are you, man? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, you know, just uh, surviving pretty much over here on the West Coast. I know you're probably in a similar situation as we are still over here, you know, with all the uh, things kind of shut down still. But, uh, you know, surviving, making money and paying the bills. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. That's really all you can do right now. That's about as positive as you can get. I'm not dead yet is the most positive there you go. 2020. There you go. Like somebody asks you, how are you doing? I'm not dead yet. I'm still here. <laughs> like, nor like normally people would just say, I woke up this morning. And you would find that as a blessing. Now it actually yeah. is. Now For you, sure. Now you can't even argue with it if you have, like, a terrible job or something. Yeah. You know, yeah. Hey, at least you got a job, you know? Yeah. Your relationship's not going great. Any of that. Now you have to look at it as a blessing. Yeah, for but sure. Anyway, I've, I want to get this out of the way. He found out how much of a hooligan I was, you know, because I was making jokes and everything. I'd love to bring him on with comedians one day because he, he was taking the jokes really well, and I was trying to be good too. See, the thing is, I'm mad because the only soda I have in the fridge is Mountain Dew. And I've come to a realization that there's only two types of people that do this. There's single men that are really ugly, and there's people that are coming up in two years in a relationship or longer. <laughs> because we're the only ones who have any right to drink this right here. Uh, but anyways, I'm going to start using that. I can't believe I just thought of that right now. That's, hey, that's Jay, good. That's good. Thanks for getting the Mountain Dew, even though you only got like one bottle of it for some reason. I never, I've never seen somebody bring like one bottle of something home, just to put in the fridge. True, that, that is true. Yeah, thought. it's a small bottle too. It's not even like a, a liter or anything. Yeah, it's just a regular bottle. Only <laughs> thing, the only thing that could have made this worse is you just get one single can. Hey, you know, times are tough right ridiculous. now. That'd have been the most right ridiculous now. thing I've ever seen. <laughs> only, only type of Mountain Dew I drink is Code Red because if you put any kind of pineapple. You know, vodka, rum, and that is really good. Mm. I don't know if you drink, but you should try it. <laughs> you look pretty skinny, so I don't even know if you can drink. No, I can. I am skinny, though. You're right. <laughs> I'm I'm uh, I'm a six foot seven walking skeleton. <laughs> you're six foot seven. Yeah. You're over a foot taller than me. I'm five six. Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's about Jack the reaction I get. We got Jack and the Beanstalk up in this mug. Oh, Basically. man, they should put you on American <laughs> Horror Story, you tall ass. That's what I'm trying, man. That's that's my career path, honestly. I'm trying to get those odd roles because that's, yeah. my, that's my bread and butter. You know, that's what I focus on most is uh, the film industry. Yeah, you, you, you just sitting there with, like, Yao Ming and Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> be the weirdest tall duo I've ever seen. Uh, it would be a strange one for sure. Yeah, but... You know, I was trying to look up stuff about you, you know, for the show, so me and you could go back and forth about it. I don't have too many actors on here, actually. I've had broadcasters on. I've had athletes on. I've mm -hmm. had musicians on. I have comedians on all the time because, like I was telling you, they're just ignorant-ass people. <laughs> but I don't really get too many actors. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about is just how you got into acting, and how, from how you started, we'll go from there. 
All right. Well, honestly, I kind of got into acting by accident. I wanted to be a paleontologist when I was younger. I mean, you can see that didn't turn out how I thought it would. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I mean, come on, dinosaurs, right? Every kid likes dinosaurs. About to say you're as long as some of them. You know, I'm I'm a brachiosaurus, basically, man. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, in middle school, I kind of got into some like. Uh, prose reading, which is like interpretive reading and stuff. High school, they were like, hey, you should join theater. I'm doing the, the condensed version of the story because it can go on a little bit longer. Uh, I kind of got, got, got into theater. I enjoyed it. I kind of, you know, got hazed the first year I was in theater being the freshman or whatever. And then from there, I kind of just, I stayed in the, in the acting world. I, I loved every second of it. I went to community college back home. I did theater there, and then I always wanted to do, like, voiceover and stuff and film. So L.A. was, you know, the answer pretty much. You know, every, everything happens. This is the industry capital. So yeah. I moved out to L.A., went to school out here, and I've been now, which I'm very proud of, surviving and living in L.A. over a year now, out of school as an actor, and, uh, yeah, it's been good. Where are you from originally? Uh, Texas originally. Oh, Okay. Did yeah. you like live in a city or were you like a small town boy? Small town. Like my okay. graduating class was 82. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you see, you see, I live in the suburbs. So I'm in like that awkward in between area. Nobody you, likes man. the suburbs. Everybody hates us. Just like everybody hates New Jersey. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. Yeah. Jersey Shore messed that one up for us. I didn't do this. <laughs> I, just, I just came out like this. We, we look and sound a lot better when we're not on TV. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you got your start as an actor. What was the first play that you ever did, and how was it? Ooh, first play I ever did was a play called, oh, what was it called? It was a military play. It was, this is in high school. I can't remember the name. I had a very small role, but I had to, I remember I had to kiss, I had to kiss a girl in that play and I never kissed a girl on stage. And I freaked <laughs> out the first time that the girl came up to me because she kind of tried to surprise me with it. Uh, and I okay. just like jumped back. Cause here I am. First off, I'm, I'm like still, I'm under six foot. Right. Okay. I didn't have my growth spurt till like uh, mid sophomore year or whatever. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm under six foot right now. I'm still, you know, a gangly tall dude, but then I was, you know, maybe, five foot seven a hundred and maybe 10 pounds or something look, like that look half normal exactly i look I, yeah exactly i didn't have the height yet to make me look abnormal <laughs> <laughs> but uh but no the play it was uh it was a smaller role but it was i actually had to smoke also on stage i had to use a fake cigarette and that was weird to me because okay. you know it's like i've never done anything like that in my life but it's kind of what happens in the acting world in theater you kind of really you're bound, you know, you, you push yourself out of your comfort zone and it's cool because you learn about yourself and you also grow as a person, I feel like too. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, the first play was, was a pretty good one. My favorite show I ever did was uh, in college a play called our town. Uh, definitely my favorite show I've ever done. If you ever heard of Thornton Wilder, I don't know how much you know about like plays and playwrights and stuff, but. I feel like I've heard the name before, but I don't know. Yeah. What he's he's Pretty, pretty famous playwright. Our Town is like one of the most done plays year round in the U.S. So, okay. But, but yeah, and then I got out here and got into the wanted to try the film world. Voiceover specifically was my main focus. But as I started to work more and more out here, I realized that uh, I have a I have a frame and build for the odd roles, and you know I'll yeah. take it. I mean that's fair. You know you already mentioned how tall you were. Listen, I feel like I could do it, but I've, I've grown in the other direction. I'm very wide, <laughs> a.k.a. I'm fat. All, hey, the, all, all, this, all this Mountain Dew and leftover beer in my fridge mixed with that Popeye's fried chicken. It's helping, oh. me, get my, it's helping me get into my acting career. D don't even talk about Popeye's fried chicken, man. Popeye's is my go-to fast food. I oh, love man. some Popeye's, man. When I was, when I, when I was back home still... Every every Thursday and Wednesday, my dad and I, when I wasn't in school, would go and get uh, Popeyes, and they got to, we went there so much they actually got to know us, and they knew our order okay. when we walked in the door. Okay, yeah, no, that's that's how I am with the boss over there now. Honestly, I was gonna ask you where the hell all that fried chicken goes, but I forgot you're a Texas boy. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That'll, that'll find 
that'll find its way to fit in there somewhere. I mean, man, I'll eat. I'll eat a whole. I could eat two pizzas, and you won't see a, a an ounce of weight gained on me. It's crazy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, hey, man, it works because you're gonna always be fit for that odd role, too. Yeah. One hundred percent. Exactly. With that, with the lanky build and everything, but one hundred percent. You mentioned that acting has kind of, you know, helped you grow as a person. I feel like with I feel like anybody that follows their passion, you know, you're going to grow as a person and learn not only about your passion, but about life as, you know, you go along with it and you keep doing it for a longer, longer period of time. For so sure. I just want to ask, you know, how has it really helped you grow as a person? Like, give me an example. Oh, man. I mean, I would just say the maturity that I've had to take on just over biggest thing for me was like moving out here to school i'd never been away from my parents for more than maybe two weeks at a time okay and so moving out here kind of you know taking that big step of moving across country being the only person out here that i know in la you know la will swallow you whole if you're not careful it does it to people yeah. every single day and kind of just knowing that you know it's not guaranteed especially i mean the acting industry is though i feel like one of the hardest industries to actually make it in and yeah. it's never people think it's going to be like a simple you know like oh man i have the look or i have that but it in today's world especially even now during COVID, like during the quarantine and everything it's like it's all about who you know the connections you make and yeah. just being like a, a really you know being somebody that people want to work with being a nice person being polite being kind don't, don't you know don't don't try to be you know that you're better than everybody else because you can get off a set and then they're done for the rest of your life. But I would say just in the fact of that, I kind of had to learn so much about because, because I'm an only child and I was spoiled, you know, growing up, my, my mom, my, I'm a mom's boy, you know, she, she spoiled me with everything. So, um, just That's having to kind of, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, so just having to, you know, be on my own and just setting, setting up things for myself about, you know, I'm going to do this. What's my next move? You know, uh, just continuing on in the acting world in general. I mean, I have so many friends out here that can attest the same thing. It's like, especially now, you know, when COVID hit, it's, it's rough. I mean, the industry, you know, shut down. I'm sure yeah. you're aware of that. And, you know, I got another job just because yeah, I wanted amazing. to be doing something. So. Yeah. And I mean, you got to pay the bills too. You had to. You 100%. Know, my girlfriend, you know, her hours got cut back. I was very fortunate. You know, I was working full time the entire way through. But mm -hmm. there was a lot of people that, you know, lost a lot through the quarantine. All kinds of comedians were out of work. Mm -hmm. Some of them that were able to rely on this, I'm sure, had to get jobs. And, you know, it's crazy how this affected all the different people. Some of them probably couldn't even get jobs because they couldn't find any. Yeah, I feel like the arts products. got hit more than some other, you know, more than most other uh, industries, honestly. That's I really it. do. Because, like, an artist they don't you know they're they're not working 24 7 so like when when the industry shuts down like they've got what they've made and that's it you know if you're not a if you're not you know a, a tom hanks a dicaprio a brad you know brad pitt those type of people uh jennifer aniston all those type of people it's like you gotta work you know otherwise i mean that rent's not gonna go away and rent out here i'm sure as as there is not uh cheap it's not it's it's definitely not cheap in New Jersey, considering we're right next to New York too. Exactly. You know, it's it's definitely gonna be more than in most places. May maybe if you were living in Texas, you'd be able to get by, move back in with mama and everything. But For sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, but uh, I mean, because I have a lot of people that went home, uh, you know, went back to their with their parents. And I, I did go home and visit my parents over the fourth of July and stuff, but um you know, I, I know this is where I, you know, I, I want to be, you know, this is what I want to do. And, you know, you just gotta, it's, it's, I mean, it's kind of cliche, but it's the grind, you know, it, it's the artist. I know you being a comedian, you understand it. There's always a grind. There's always a, you know, a question about like, okay, it, you know, is it worth it? But if you, like you said, if you enjoy what you're passionate, what you're doing, then it's 100% worth it. Yeah. No, you know, if you really are passionate about something, you're going to find a way to do it. You know, it doesn't exactly. matter what else is in the way. I, Cause I work at Amazon. I remember, you know, peak season was going by 
I was working six days a week. You know, the gigs didn't stop. I was, I just started over at WBCB, you know, where mm-hmm. I've been lucky enough to just get back into now because they closed down during COVID as well. I yeah. was only sending them stuff for about five months, you know, before they were starting to get me back in the station. But, I mean, the grind doesn't stop. I was, I had to be, you know, either a worker at the station at seven in the morning every day. You know, there would be days where I would take time and I would go to the station for three hours and then come back to work for the rest of my shift. And and they're about 35, 40 minutes in between each other. So, I mean, it's a grind, but, you know, with your passion, you know, you, you always find a way. You know, 100%. People will, 100%. People will make excuses for, you know, all the things that they may want to do, but they're questioning in their head, is it worth it? You know, when yeah. it's your passion, you know, you, you don't make those excuses. You just do it no matter exactly. what. Exactly. 100%. Yeah. All right. So, you know, as we've been talking about, you know, for only the last 20 minutes, you're an actor, you're out in LA. Um, what was like the first role that, you know, you got in LA that kind of started helping you get your foot in the door there? Oh, let's see. Um, for me, I would say, so I, I'm, I work with, I do a lot of back, I do, well, I don't do a lot of background, but I've done some background work and the first gig I ever booked, you know, was just a normal year, hey, you're in the background type of thing, da, 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 da. But what I found over time, this is why I was still in school, because I, I didn't do a job while I was in school. I just dedicated my time to be fully in school. Um, but I was, uh, you know, I was going about and I wasn't booking any, you know, t- any background. And I was, you know, wondering why, 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 why. And then I finally booked something with some other guys, all tall guys. Uh, okay. And they said they don't book anything either. Well, what I found out is, you know, they just don't use us because we're very distracting. But everything I booked since then has been uh you know very unique to me the biggest the biggest thing i've booked so far of creature stuff that i would say that i can speak about at this moment was i did a music video for an artist named Maisie k where i did like a shadow creature and full prosthetics and everything uh you can find that on youtube if you want to like check it out or whatever but uh it was that was a really that was when i kind of was like okay i can make money off of doing this creature work and i've made money i've made you know some all right money so far for doing the creature work it's just i was i was so on a roll with doing everything before covid hit and then covid hit and i just kind of oh, yeah. just bottomed out i also did uh i'm sure you're familiar with horror nights for universal yeah 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 i did horror nights last year for universal and i was frankenstein so wow just trying to just trying to find different things to you know get my face out there you know some yeah. of the shows i've worked on i haven't been you know cast a cast member but i've been around you know the head makeup people the the you know uh the directors the producers they're all seeing my face they're getting to know who i am and they're saying oh there's this tall guy that matches our tall guy that we have on set right now that's you know 40 40 years younger yeah so it's like it's all about who you know in this industry it really is and that's kind of how i've gotten all my opportunities is just by knowing people so yeah you the more people you meet as you go through, you know, where you're trying to go, you know, the better chance you got of something happening down the line. Exactly. You know, it, it, you never, the thing is, you never know when it's going to happen. You know, it 100%. could take a few months, could take a few years, could take a lot of years. You know, we don't, we have no way to know, but the more you go out of your way to meet all these different people and to do all these different things, you know, the better you make your chances of exactly. making something out of yourself and what you want to do. And that and Maisie I'm, K video, were you just a shadow? I do want to ask that really quick. No, I was like, you can see me in the video. I was like a okay. creature. So I had like, basically, I had a full blacked out face. I had uh, no eyes no, and no mouth. Okay. Spikes on my head, a giant like black cape, and then like long fingers with nails on the end. Okay, I was about to say so much for getting your face out there. If you were just a shadow, no, you can you can see me. I mean, you can't see my face, but you can see the the <laughs> shape of my face, basically. Hey, that's the that's the creature work, though. That's the industry. Okay. <laughs> I, was, 
I was going to say, if somebody finds out that was you, that might work. But other than that, nobody's going to see your face. You might make a really good Slender Man if they find out who it is. Hey, fun uh, fun fact. I've actually worked with the guy that, that played that Slender Man for the movies. And really? I'm actually his exact height and nearly exact same build. So oh, wow. hopefully that kind of helps me open some doors as well. <laughs> I had a friend of mine, he dressed up as Slender Man. This is when I was in my freshman year in college. This is when I just started doing radio, too. I was uh-huh. going on, you know, because this was the first year that, you know, the station that I was at, WSBR Radio, this was the first time they had an actual radio station and not just a production booth because the student center on the campus finally got built. Because this is a really small campus. It's two blocks you know, we only got about like 3,000 students in the entire school. You know, it's really small. Mm. So they were celebrating the station, you know, finally being built because this took years. And the station manager had all of us in the studio talking to us about different things, all the hosts of all the different shows. And my friend, while I'm talking, comes up by the window. This this man is dressed as Slender Man. This happened around Halloween. Yeah. And you just you couldn't see his eyes or where they were going, but you ever feel somebody just staring at you from behind? Oh, yeah. That's a terrifying feeling. Yeah. And it was working too, because he was tall. I don't know if he was as tall as you, but he, he was tall, he was skinny, and you just and you just felt like the staring motion like through the mask he was wearing. Yeah. I, bl- I blame Slender Man for the fact that we got to wear masks just based off that. Because <laughs> he was doing it before they were cool. Uh, I did the Slender Man thing uh, two times. I, I won the first year, I put pantyhose over my head because I didn't have anything else. And the second year, I actually found the costume. So <laughs> I upgraded. <laughs> you upgraded from pantyhose to the real thing. Exactly. The panty- the pantyhose were just practice. It was a head condom for what would happen later. Exactly, exactly. Leveling up. There you go. <laughs> I was going to say, he brought the mask out before it was cool, though. The thing is, I have a beard. So, you know, it gets everywhere, like in the mouth, down the neck. It's very oh, uncomfortable. Yeah. And when I get it really long, it comes down the sides. Every day I leave work, I leave there looking like a big-ass hobbit. <laughs> hey, there you I go. There's a roll for you. There's a roll yeah, for you. Right? I was gonna say, if little five six foot six me doesn't feel like Bobo Swaggins either. <laughs> you could you paint me blue, I could be a giant Smurf. <laughs> I was gonna say they got Papa Smurf, Smurfette, they got everybody else. They need the giant Smurf now. There you go. There you go. I I, I found my niche. I think I got it. There it is. Okay, so what's been like your favorite role? as an actor it could be something you did in high school college after you got out anything i'd still probably have to say so it's a tie between the stage manager that's the actual name of the role it's not the stage manager because that you know in (laughs) theater you have a stage manager um (laughs) either that in our town which was the stage manager which was an incredible role or uh, a role from the collector which is a very unknown I actually have the book uh, by John, what's his name? Hold on. John Fowles, that's his name. John Fowles um, is the other role, I would say. Uh, I did a scene with a classmate named Tria, uh, and that was one of the most fulfilling scenes I've ever had as an actor for film-wise. That was in school. So that either that or for the film side, the collector, for the stage side, the stage manager, and uh, our town. Okay, gotcha. I was going to say, what made that so much fun to do? Was it just the... The collector... uh, So the stage manager basically was like uh, playing... You you basically you you knew everything. So you were you were the person that, which is something you don't get to do in theater, is you get to talk to the audience. I got to break the fourth wall, which is a rule you never you know break in theater. So I was just observing everything that was going on throughout the play. And then I would come out with monologues or I'd go out in the audience and talk to the audience about what they were seeing. But that was all the character. And at the end, and then I'd also interact with the people in the show. And it basically tells a story. It's a love story between two, two characters, but it takes you through their whole life, basically. 
And then the end is a very open-ended question about, you know, what happens after, you know, uh, we die in the afterlife and things like that. It kind of leaves it up to the, it leaves it up to the the viewer to kind of figure out how they want it to end, basically. Okay. So, like, what did you, I'm I'm actually kind of curious now that you brought that up. What, what did you take from what happens after you die? Uh, well, I believe in uh, heaven and hell. So, I mean, I come from I came from a, a church background. Being, I mean, being in Texas, you know, I come from a Baptist background. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, since I moved out to, what you, are you gonna say? No, you you know you were just like being from Texas. Oh, I mean, I feel like because it's the Bible Belt out there, you know, in that area, especially okay. East Texas. Yeah. Um, so you know, I believe that you know, if you die, if you're uh, if you're um, you know uh, saved, that you go to heaven or mm. you don't. That's that's what I personally believe. Okay, I yeah. I didn't know if you like took something away from that. You know, after like you die, like maybe you think maybe like something else happens. Honestly, I only thought you brought up the Texas thing because you didn't you didn't want to give me a chance to say it. Oh no 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 uh uh-uh, uh uh uh-uh. no I feel like that's like a I I like a give me type of thing honestly. <laughs> okay, all right, because I I've never actually been that far across the country so i don't really know what the feeling is like although i i will talk about this really quick i do have a comic friend because i've been able to connect with all different people from all over the country even some yeah. comedians from outside of it i've met one from india i met one from the uk i met one from tanzania which is a country in south africa you know just people from all over the place i have this one that's from nebraska you know, at least I at least I remember that Texas is a state. You know, some of those states that you don't even remember exist. Right? Yeah, yeah. You know, like, like New Jersey, for example. No, no. People <laughs> people know who New Jersey is. You that I know, and I know it's true because you thought to say that BS right there. <laughs> just so just so everybody knows, I was trying not to cuss tonight, but we came up with the name of my next special. You know, whenever that's going to be it's going to be called ignorant bullshit i i thought i'd make that psa clear right now it's going to be called ignorant bullshit now we know who new jersey is just because you thought to say some bullshit anyway <laughs> i have a comic friend who lives out in nebraska right it's one yeah. of those things you don't remember like iowa idaho montana you know you forget their states you know but i remembered that now but It's about a 17-hour drive for me, Mm -hmm. and the comedian friend that we both met from the UK, she said she's planning on visiting there, and she ended up telling me, buckle up, I'm going to be there by next spring. I told her, oh, I'll buckle up, but about halfway through that 17-hour drive, I might be tempted to loosen the seatbelt just a little bit. (laughs) I've tried... The farthest I've traveled is Connecticut for comedy, and that was about a five, six hour drive with traffic. Wow. Without it, it's about four, but it was it was pretty bad. There was a couple accidents on there. And that was hell trying to get there. You know, just being fat and being in a car for five, six hours, I was hungry. I told the audience that night that I was so hungry that I didn't lick the plate clean. I just started licking the menu before I even ordered the food. <laughs> there you go. You know, just like, oh, I want a cheeseburger. You want more fries? Oh, nah, fuck that. Onion rings. <laughs> hey, I can share your pain in the car, though. I mean, tall people got it, got it tough, too. I, I, can, I can imagine. You probably look like the hunchback in Notre Dame just trying to drive. <laughs> you're not wrong you're not yeah. wrong there that is an accurate depiction of me driving a car <laughs> you get, you got the wide frame so putting your hands on two and ten you look like this <laughs> yeah pretty much or, or you lean way back and just reach yeah. out <laughs> you try to turn your thumbs are touching each other <laughs> no the worst oh. part is when your knees are touching the steering wheel that's the worst part oh here's here, i can imagine that but here's the thing when you're short Because if you want to, like, lean the seat back and, like, pull it back, you see, sometimes you forget you did that. So you're, like, trying to, like, reach for the pedal super hard. You're, like, diagonal. You can barely see out the windshield anymore. 
and you're trying to get a hold of yourself because you forgot to, you know, fix the seat before you started the car. It's it's sure. it's a struggle, man. You know, I'm trying to break with my one big toe. <laughs> and that's I never get that. fun to do. Huh? I get I said I get that. I get that. <laughs> no, I don't I, I don't know. I understand. I understand. I understand it. I don't I don't feel it. I don't experience it, but I understand it. You understand the logic. All right. I got it. <laughs> that's fair. But yeah. I do want to talk about, you know, you doing radio, you podcasting as well. How did sure. you lead into that exactly? Because I know you want to do acting. Yeah, I mean, I feel like nowadays, to be an actor, you kind of have to be multifaceted. You kind of have to do a bunch of different things. No actor does one thing, and yeah. especially, you know, in today's world. But for radio, for me, I always was interested in voiceover back home. That's what I really wanted to focus on. Uh, just because people were like, oh, you have a great voice, you should do radio, things like this, da 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 uh, So I got a little experience back home uh, calling some play-by-play -play for a collegiate baseball team and just shadowing okay. for the for a summer. And then I moved out here. Uh, I don't know how much of a gamer you are. Um, My girlfriend's the really big gamer. I'm a okay. little bit of a gamer. I ever, get so I, fucking mad when I play Fall Guys. <laughs> hey, I, I, I got wins game. for days. I got wins for days. Oh, well, that, uh, well, well, that's you. I usually lose by the third or fourth round, and I lose it. I'm, I've, 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 I've had to control myself lately because I'm about to break one of our controllers, but... Hey, that's, that's, frustrating. Me, and Call of Duty. that's me and Call of Duty. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> but, um, so if you've heard of Steam, the PC uh, yeah. gaming platform... So I do... Basically, I was playing a game one time called American Truck Simulator, uh, basically, it's a simulator where you drive a truck. Imagine that. And I was listening to the radio in game, and they were advertising. Uh, basically, you want to be a personality. Okay. So, long story short, I cut a demo uh, with the help of one of my friends, Elliot, and another one, Carol. Shout out to them if Elliot's listening, and shout out to you, Elliot. Mm -hmm. And then um, I sent it in. I got the I got the opportunity. They did like a week trial run with me, and I've been now doing. A Thursday show every, every Thursday. It's it's kind of changed depending on my schedule and everything. But okay. two hours show every Thursday now on that radio station for uh, three and a half years. Let me ask you something: Is that Believe Podcast Network or is this the other one? No, this is the other one. So Believe okay. came after that. Believe came after that. Yeah, and then to, to segue into tend to believe. Uh, basically, after that, it was when was it? Maybe a. I think it was it was the last year i think uh they reached out to me and said they liked some of my ideas i sent them an email because i saw it on linkedin right where we yeah. where we met originally and yeah. uh, i sent i sent in a thing like for my original ideas never heard back and then six seven months later you know i got a call from their uh, one of their producers or whatever their talent uh producers or whatever and they were like hey we like some of your ideas uh we'd love to you know go through with that and that kind of, you know, that kind of speaks in the way, like, just don't give up. You know, you never know what's going to happen type of thing. But it's been on hiatus for a while, but I do, I did do a plot podcast on there about the film industry and the box office. But since okay. no movies have come out in the past, you know, six months, the box yeah, office yeah. has been on a hiatus. But okay. yeah, so I do do that. I also do the radio for truckers.fm as the station and then... I stream. I just picked up streaming during quarantine, so I'm having a lot of fun with that on Twitch, and then uh, also acting. So trying to, you know, put my hand in many different ways to try to, you know, move the creativity and my outreach to uh, just a group, you know, and the best way I can, building my brand basically. Yeah. Of myself. You know I, yeah. You know what I think would be great though, like if you were able to like share like the news, like about what could be happening with like future movies. I don't know how big you are in the Marvel with DC, but I was on another comics podcast. He calls it Comics Who Love Comics. It's done by this guy named Brett Singer. And we started talking about Suicide Squad and all mm -hmm. the different characters that were going to be in it, you know, how they made room for Will Smith potentially coming back. Because he was yeah. one of the few good things about the original Suicide Squad. That yep. was I was, I was going to say it was him and Margot Robbie, but Margot Robbie is good in anything, okay? She is She's bad. phenomenal. She's phenomenal. Yeah. You, 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 you understand where I'm going with this. 
Yeah, you for know, sure, for sure. You, you know, all, just talking about just talking about it makes me sick that I'm drinking this Mountain Dew. <laughs> Sorry, that was a pretty terrible joke. But, yeah, there were there wasn't a lot good about Suicide Squad, but their roles no. honestly though were great. But, oh yeah, for sure. You know, we ended up talking about you know the different writers that are on it, all the different characters that are going to be in it. They have a lot bigger set list of characters, which. I think yeah. it's great. John Cena making an appearance. Yeah. And that and that's going to be interesting too cuz he's supposed to be the peacemaker. Yeah. You know, if you ever if you ever watch wrestling, he's done so much hustle, loyalty, respect that it makes snarky wrestling fans sick to their stomachs now when they see him. <laughs> yeah. No, but, I mean, oh. Yeah, you're a big you're big into wrestling, yeah? Yeah, when I I actually I'm actually kind of glad you told me it took like believe 6 7 months to get back to you. Because, well, let me ask you this first. Was the guy that reached out to you, was his name Nick? No. So they've had an, a switch. The guy that reached out uh, to me was somebody else. Yeah. That was a okay. recent switch. Okay. Because I re- cause Nick was the one who reached out to me about doing it, you know, about trying to set up a call and everything, you know, about four or five weeks ago now. And I didn't yeah. know, like, it took you, like, six, seven months for them to even call you back. So... I actually, yeah. eh, you know, you know, it sucks that it, it would take that long for anybody, but I'm actually a little bit relieved to hear that and that I didn't just get left on the back burner. Yeah, for sure. I mean, because it's, you know, that's what you kind of think. You're like, oh, man, they're not, they, they didn't like my, because you instantly start judging yourself. They don't like my idea. They don't like me. Yeah. Da, 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 da. When, when most of the time it has nothing to do with you. It's just that, you know, they have their busy. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was going to say, because, you know, he talked about setting up the call with me. You know, there was, you know, I gave him my availability and we got closer and closer to the week ending and, you know, I'm following up with them and, you know, then I just started waiting for it. So, you know, now, now I know I don't have to judge myself as much. Yeah, for sure, man. No, I think that's a great idea. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of wrestling. I don't watch it as much as I used to, uh, just because, you know, most of the guys that I liked are gone, but yeah. like. I was when I was in even high school, I was I was huge into it, huge into wrestling. That oh, Undertaker yeah. documentary was oh my god, beautiful, that was beautiful. L- listen, I want to say as a sports fan, the goat of documentaries might be the Undertaker's. F the Michael Jordan documentary. <laughs> no, the Undertaker's doc was so well done. That ending is just that's it's perfect. It's literally perfect. It's a perfect it's a perfect end to a wrestling career. Undertaker, please don't come back. No, I don't think he will. I think he's done. I I, I hope he's done. I really, really do. Because that's Undertaker. It's perfect. it's perfect. Undertaker, we say this because we love you. Don't come back. hundred percent. A hundred percent. Not 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 because it's not gonna be a good wrestling match, but you know, don't come back. You're old, you're broken down, you're decrepit, you're walking on crutches at one point. We say yeah. this because we care about you. Don't come back. Live live your life with, with your family now. Take time. Spend time with them. You've given us enough. You, yeah. You've given the WWE family enough. Now now take time for yourself and your family. Don't walk on crutches permanently because Goldberg did a messed up jackhammer dropping you on your oh, head. Oh, my goodness. I was so scared when I saw that for the first time. Because, listen, I get, I'm, I'm scared every time he just starts walking down to the ring now. Oh man, you like that documentary? You just saw I, it was so cool to see so much behind the scenes of such a a, a mysterious character. You know, that's him. Like yeah. that's the Undertaker. You don't know. I mean, you know he's a person outside of the WWE, but it's like yeah. you don't look at him that way. He's the Undertaker. He is the yeah. Phenom, the Dead Man. Like yeah, that's you him. You don't look at him as Mark Calloway. Exactly. I Ma- married to Michelle McCool with two daughters. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know what his name was until I got into college. Because really? It, yeah, it was just The Undertaker. Yeah. You and, know. And the... Oh, go ahead. No, nah, I I was just gonna I was just gonna say that you know I remember that Shawn Michaels is actually Michael Hickenbottom. I didn't I didn't know that that about The Undertaker because of just how I looked at him. Oh, see, I didn't know Michael's name. There, I learned it, something it, new. His name is Michael Sean Hickenbottom. Oh, interesting. 
So they took his first and middle name and left the last name out because who the hell wants to be called Hickenbottom? Yeah, that's not a that's not a rust. That's not HBK. That's not the heartbreak kid. <laughs> that's the Hickenbottom kid. <laughs> I was gonna... but, it, uh... it hurts my heart to even bring up. Like it just takes him down so much. Oh, I know, I know. I was having a conversation with my buddy Miguel a couple days ago, actually, about like who you would put, who we would put on our wrestling like Mount Rushmore, and we were kind of saying like Undertaker has to be there. Absolutely. We said uh, The Rock. That's fair. Um, we said Cena. I feel like Cena is the Rock of this generation. Mm. You don't think so? You don't think Cena belongs up there? Not on the Ru- not on the Mount Rushmore. I think this. I actually did uh, like a top ten list with some buddies of mine. You know, uh-huh. back when I actually just started doing this podcast, I put him at like number eight. Okay, so, like he's in the top ten, but I wouldn't put him on Ra- Mount Rushmore. I put him in top five personally. Okay, I mean yeah. I can see why because he was the face for so long. You know, everybody. And the thing with wrestling is the important thing is the reaction. He always got the reaction. Oh, yeah, whether he was a heel or a good guy, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was supposed to be a good guy that almost that entire time, but nobody <laughs> no one him. Likes him. Well, I've never, I've never seen a face in wrestling booed so much in my life. I Except know. for Roman Reigns now, but that's, but that's starting to change. Mm-hmm. For sure. But, no, yeah, wrestling – Wrestling was a big part of my of my like Friday Night SmackDown, Monday Night Raw every week. Hundred yeah. percent. I was gonna say I became a wrestling fan when I was about eleven. I think the first match I ever saw was Rob Van Dam versus The Big Show on the Ooh. reboot of ECW. That I remember what, that. That was what got me to be a wrestling fan, which is like the worst match possible out of anybody. Because I don't 100%. know anybody else that became a wrestling fan off of another shit show like that. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> hey, that, that shows you're a true fan then. There you yeah. go. Or, or an impressionable 11-year-old that didn't want to believe <laughs> it was fake yet. Hey, man. That's, hey, that's acting too. That's, all, that's theater. It's live theater. Yeah. When people, were, when people were throwing papers and sodas and popcorn... I wanted to believe it's because they actually hated the big show, not because they hated what was going on. <laughs> I didn't put all that together yet. See, Innocent 11 year old you. It's acceptable to like John Cena as a boy until you get past the age of 12. Yeah. I was 11. I just made it. You made it. You made my, it. It's, it's like when my dad became a corrections officer. He became one at 44. The age limit is 45. It's the same thing. Wow. It's the, it's the exact same thing. Honestly, I almost ended up going to fire school at one point. I feel like that's going to happen when I'm 44 now, now that it didn't work out. <laughs> right? Yeah. So here, so here's the thing about how I got into fire school. I started off wanting to do this, radio. Then I met a bunch of comedians, decided I wanted to do comedy. Started doing comedy, decided I wanted to jump into a fire. <laughs> that's a good one. That, that's a good that's one. Okay. It that's took me a second. It took me a second, but because I was actually, I thought it was a story, honestly, and then and then I caught it. I caught it. The thing is, though, and I'm trying to get better with this as I go along. I'm not the best storyteller with comics, be, with comedy, because I talk too much. You know, the story drags out whenever I try to get along with the story in there, and then I don't get the punchlines in fast enough. I'm trying to, you know, get a little bit better with that. But it's hard for me because, you know, you got to get to the punches, like, nice and quick. I have yeah. more stuff about fire school that I put in it. But it's, you know, more of a summary of, you know, how, this, how having this beard isn't going to work with that. And, you know, beard jokes going into fat jokes and stuff like that. Listen, man, hey. are you a sports fan? Oh, 100%. Go Pack Go all, all day, right. every day. Look, man, I'm so fat. When I see Patrick Mahomes play football, I look like the Hawaiian punch kid, okay? <laughs> That's what I start thinking of. I start thinking of the Hawaiian punch kid. 
Oh my goodness. Only with that hair on my head and these cheeks, I'd look like a Cabbage Patch Kid. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Listen, man, I'm so fat. When I see somebody with a widow's peak haircut, I think of the McDonald's symbol. Oh, man, you calling me out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you calling me out now. I see how it is with the widow's peak over well, here. You there's there, there's a friend of mine. See, you can you can hide it with your hair. You do you did it the way I do it. My mine isn't really bad at all, but yeah, you know you did it. You do it the way I do it. You put it to the side. You're able to hide it. A hundred percent. I have this one friend who normally has very very short hair, and his widow's peak is very distinct. Like it makes Ooh. like it makes it makes yours not look bad at all. It's like how LeBron's hairline touches the back of his neck. It's very t- <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. And I tell him, like, I got this joke from you because you just won't grow out your hair. You need to grow it out so you can get that McDonald's symbol out of my face. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. My dumb self in high school. So I had the same haircut up until senior year of high school. Senior year, I was like, I'm going to grow my hair out. I'm going to change my look, right? I was like, I don't need a widow's peak. So I shaved it. Mm. In my senior pictures, I have my hair nice and styled with a nice little triangle sitting Uh, on the top of my forehead. Oh, you messed up. I never did that again. Wait, like, what do you mean there was, like, a triangle there? Did, like, they miss a spot or something? Like, so it wasn't. It wasn't so. I had this. It had like a very military type haircut. I would say growing up, and you the the peak always had the had the longer area of the whole front, right? And when I decided to finally start growing my hair out, it got to a point where it was longer, but the peak was not long enough to be styled into the rest of my hair. So I was like, oh, I'll just you know, I'll just cut it off. And so when I'd pull my hair back, where the peak was, because the hair was growing back, were a bunch of little dots of the hair follicles. But it was shaved, so it was growing like it looked like a. I ha- basically had a ha- uh, a triangle highlighted on my forehead. Yeah. Ah, oh, that 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 must have been awful. I am so sorry for your loss. <laughs> it's all I right. Realize, I-, I realize one of the things I have to be thankful for when it comes to my mom is she would make fun of my facial features. Whenever I grow my hair out, she tells me I look like Mufasa from The Lion King. Hey, I get the same. Like, when I grow my hair out, which I finally can do, my, my dad gave me a hard time, too. Wait, hold on. Like, what did he say to you, though? Uh, he was, well, first off, I've never grown facial hair, right? I forget, uh, what he, I forget exactly what he said, but it was when I went home for 4th of July. But get this. You want to know the kicker? He's now growing a mustache himself. So who's, who is the one really, really talking here? Listen. You know, if, if you pick a thousand, if you pick, I'm going to say a hundred thousand people out of a crowd, about four of them look good with mustaches. Okay. True. true. You know, there, true. there are, there are not many people off in this world. There are not many people in this world that can pull off a mustache. I don't even think Steve Harvey pulls off a mustache. Well, Ooh, that's a tough one for me. That man's mustache is, is next level. Listen. Listen, it's it's just it's just so straight, and then at the bottom, like if you look close, you can see it's lumpy. It looks like an actual caterpillar. <laughs> You're not wrong, though. Listen, I've I've heard him say this himself because I watch Family Feud when I get bored, and I like to see him roast people. The oh, distance from the, the distance from my nose to the top of my lip is four feet. <laughs> hey, he's a he great looks person. Like the plywood. <laughs> I've seen him live. He's he's a character, man. He's so much fun. Listen, I have never seen a crowd of people laugh so hard in my life than when I'm watching that. Oh man! And and when the cameras aren't rolling, he's just as funny. No, I was just gonna say. He's pr- I was gonna say it's pr- it's probably even worse. Yeah. Oh yeah. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. See, my goal, I think, with comedy. And I think this is how I'm. This is how I know I'm really gonna get good, is when I'm as funny on stage as I am in real life. There you go. Because I feel I feel like I'm pretty fun. I'm pretty. I feel like I'm pretty damn funny in real life. I just have to catch up on stage. Yeah. 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 
There's, you know, I've, I've been cracking jokes on people all my life. It's it's a whole different feeling going on stage and actually. Going. Oh, one hundred percent. Because you're vu- you're vulnerable. Then you're not. You're they're expecting you to make jokes when you're not on stage. It's just like you know whatever. Throw it away. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. I've had I've had twenty five years to make jokes on people. I've had less than three to do it on stage. I'm gonna say there 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 is a difference. For and sure. Once I, once I catch up, I feel like I'll be all right. Yeah, one hundred percent. We'll get there. Definitely. Absolutely. But I do want to ask you: Is there anything in acting that you want to do in the future? Talk to me about that. Oh man. There's a really exciting thing that I worked on last year that comes out in October that might, as of now, when it comes out, will be the highlight of my career so far. Um, And it's something that I would always want to do. I can't say what it is yet, but um, I would love to work alongside Doug Jones. I have, I've had the very, if you know who that, have you seen, do you know the movie Shape of Water? Won the Oscar a couple of years ago. He's the fish, the fish man. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've had the pleasure of meeting him and becoming friends with him, which was, you know, incredible. He's such a down to earth, amazing human being, so knowledgeable and so just loving and caring and willing to just, you know, talk to you. Like, even though, you know, he's an Oscar best picture winning, you know, uh, actor. And, you know, I'm at the start of my career. He treats me just the same as, you know, we're at the same level, which is yeah. that that's finding something like that in the industry is just, that's incredible. It's truly incredible. So I have nothing but amazing things to say about Doug, but to star alongside something with him would be amazing to write something that has him in it would be incredible. Um, you know, I would love to just do more creature work. Uh, whether that be, I, I don't know what that entails. I would love to be the, the star of either a show or a film as the, as a monster, whatever, you know, show that may be or film that may be. Um, from there, I would love to get into producing. Uh, I have a I have a film that I really want to have made that uh, holds a very special place in my heart. That uh, I believe with continuing to work and you know working in industry and hopefully booking those roles and things like that will allow me to be able to fund and finance it myself and shoot it. So I think those are the big long term plans. But honestly, kind of you know keep going into the creature world. Uh, work with Doug would be an absolute dream. Uh, from there, you know, kind of branch out. Once you kind of, you know, once you're in a niche in the in the industry, and you kind of, you know, start working in that niche, and you're making money, that kind of gives you the opportunity to be like, people first off know who you are, but second off, you're like, oh, I want to try this now. I want to do this now, and you have that opportunity to kind of go out for different types of auditions and things like that, and really, really stretch yourself from, you know, because Doug didn't start as a as a creature actor. He started, you know, in just little parts here and there. He's a phenomenal actor, but most people know him because of his creature work. But he's a phenomenal actor on top of that. So that would definitely be top of my list would be star. At, so it would be, okay, I'll combine them, actually. Top of my list would be star in something with Doug as a creature with Doug. Doug Jones. Right. That would be, that'd be top of my list on the acting, uh, I guess, mountain top. <laughs> I was gonna say I don't I don't even mean to interrupt you, but if I gotta smack the shit out of one of my cats standing next to me, I apologize because I have good. two cats and they're fighting with each other right now. It's all listen, good. It's all good. Listen, listen we ha- we have this special needs cat. He has a head tilt because of an un because of an uncured ear infection. One of the stupidest mm-hmm. animals I've ever met in my life, and he always messes with me during my shows. He always Aye. finds that time to just fuck around. He's showing you love, man. He's showing you love. He knows. But he's me- he's messing with the other cat right now. He just always finds a way. He's, he's a stupid <laughs> that sounds like that sounds like that sounds like animals. Yeah. They always they always show up when you're doing something you know important. It's not like when you're not on camera or something, and then they show up like, "Hey, what's up? <laughs> we'll fight That's now." Good. My girlfriend's mad now. What I say about calling the cat stupid? He is stupid. What you said not to do it, but then I'd be lying. Okay. I don't do it to you when you're stupid. You want me? Do you want me to start lying, ma'am? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, hold on. I'm not looking in from the outside world. Hold on. Hold on. on this conversation. Yes, you do call me stupid. <laughs> so first of all, let's stop right there. I have a show to get back to. You hear that, dumbass cat? Fine, I'm feeding. 
All right, go ahead. I was going to say, maybe he'll shut up. <laughs> Trevor, you yes, are very sir. fun to have on this show, and I'm very glad that you're here enjoying everything that is going on. Thank from you me, so much, John. I really appreciate it. Yeah. From me telling Ruben to go fuck himself to what you just saw five seconds ago. <laughs> I was going to say it's that. It's been that, fun. That, that's beginning to end. Mind you, I had fried chicken stuck in my teeth the whole time. I realized it about five minutes in. Hey, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. You know, you, you know when it's like a small piece, but you can feel it? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. That's the worst. And it, was, and it was the skin, too, so it was, like, rough around the edges. Ah. Uh. So I'm, tr- I'm, tr- I'm trying to grind through this. My teeth are grinding on each other. <laughs> you know, like at the middle school dance and shit. Oh my! I didn't even—I didn't even have a middle school dance. To be fair, well, you—you're you, a Texas boy. That's why. Small you're not wrong. You're, you're not, not wrong. I was gonna say you know you—you you had room for like twelve students, and you couldn't fit any chaperones after that. The <laughs> classes. <laughs> That's so—it's so sad, but it's so true. <laughs> And I didn't even go to I, I didn't even go there when it came to the Bible Belt. That was all you. Yes, sir. You didn't even you didn't even give me a chance. No, because I know I know. Let let <laughs> let let me get this shit out before this ignorant ass dude decides to do it. <laughs> uh, but I want to I do honestly want to say thank you for coming on because I tried to be good and you broke me down. That's how I know I had a good show and that I had a good guest on. So uh, I appreciate honestly, that. One hundred percent. Thank you for coming on. You know, you were very fun to talk to. It was very fun picking your brain about acting and wrestling and radio and everything else we talked about. So thank you for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. I would love to have you back on us when I get an open spot. Yeah, John, that'd be amazing. I'd love to talk some more wrestling for sure. But thank you so much for uh, you know connecting with me and inviting me on the show. I, I really appreciate it. I had a great time. You know, you know, it would be great. We we got we me and you together gotta let Nick know we gotta do this wrestling podcast. That'd be fun, man. That'd be fun. I I, I would love to, I would love to do it. Not the thing is when I was looking at the website for Believe and they were talking about how they were trying to grow, I was really loving you know what I was getting from the website. So I definitely think that would be a fun idea. I just for spit sure. all that just now too. But. You know, 100%. Thank you for coming on. I really, really appreciate you being here, man. Absolutely, man. I really appreciate it and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Definitely. We'll stay in touch for sure. But, everybody, this has been The Roundtable here on HamiltonRadio.net, channel HR2. As always, I'm your host, John Brecco. Be back here same time, same channel next week. This was Trevor Newland. Super fun guest. If you got a play coming up, Book him in a scary role, please. He will power <laughs> over all the scared ass people in red. Okay? Make that happen. I like and it. I like it. Until then, we will see you guys next week. Deuces.